Hi everybody, Matt from National Parks at Night here. Today we're going to talk about making night portraits. I'm going to share some top tips with you on how to do it. First off, night portraiture is one of the most creative and challenging ways to do night photography. Come along with me as I share some of my hard-won tips. Tip number one, dilate time. Here we're taking a look at uh, something I shot in 2012. Uh, this is Gymnos at Gantry Park. Uh, this was shot at that time with the Nikon D700 and at 30 seconds. In my opinion, what truly defines the difference between a picture taken at night of somebody and a night portrait is a shot that shows a clear passage of time. So in this picture, the soft water that you see in here, this 30 second exposure just adds a subtle note about time passing, but the model is crispy. Now, how did I achieve that? Well, well, we'll cover that next. I include the following things in my night portraiture that either overtly or subtly include the passage of time. They include water flowing, clouds passing, cars moving through, trees or grass waving in the wind, or star trails. Now we've got two of those elements in this photograph. We've got cars passing through in the background, which don't cut off his head, that was important, and then the water getting soft around here, especially near the rocks, you can start to see it. If you want to see another example, this is a one hour exposure of Schuyler at Bar Lake State Park in Colorado. It's also from 2012. Uh, I did this on a Mamiya 7 II, so I could rip a really long exposure on film. It was Ilford XP2. Uh, it was f11, so we didn't get all of those stars, but I wanted to not lose all of the highlights because there were planes landing in the background too, which created these beautiful shapes. Uh, but in this case, I used flash to arrest my subject, and I let I had her walk out of the frame, and then we burned in the stars. We just hung out for an hour talking, and then I closed the camera and we drove away. Now this is an extreme example, but it really drives home the point about dilating time. What truly fascinates me about this is that our brains are wired to comprehend time now. We can remember stuff that happened before, but we don't see, we don't comprehend time the way that a long exposure camera can. We can't cumulatively add time and see it all together at once. So when we see it compounded in a photographic exposure, we can still understand it, but we can't comprehend it prior to the exposure, which is the part that really gets me about long exposure and night photography. And when you add portraiture into it, it adds a familiar element in there, people that we recognize, and it further creates fascination in what's happening there. And it transcends just a photograph. It becomes some form of art, a statement, a curiosity. But somehow we can comprehend this, and I think that's awfully cool, right? Tip number two. Do something that's completely impossible in the daytime. Here you're going to see that I took a series of portraits that was the night before the total solar eclipse here in 2017 of four people that I was with. These are stars in the background and you could set it up to have some sort of strings of Christmas lights or something, but these are actual stars. Now how did I get them to look the way that they do? Well, on the front of their face, I was holding up a speed light with a grid on it, and boop, I popped it, and that made them crispy and sharp, right? You see that? And then you see this after image around them. I had an LED light, a Lux Viola behind them, that I used to control Bluetooth wirelessly to just pop a little bit of light in behind so that I combined the soft with the sharp, but all these out of focus things are stars and I achieved that effect the swirly bokeh effect with a Lomo Petzval 85 millimeter lens so you can combine all sorts of things to create interesting things and when somebody looks at this they say how did you do it not like oh that's a picture of somebody right and that's the kind of fascination that we want to talk about here your unique advantage is that you have more time to do creative things than daytime photographers that extra time between the shutter opening and the shutter closing is all possibility and you should take advantage of that all right so here's an example of gabe and i finished a workshop out in utah with natural bridges and hoven weep and we were spending one last night in hoven weep uh, i set up my 70 to 200 millimeter lens and i set it to underexpose the background and that wasn't hard because it was a new moon but there was some glow on the horizon from some towns that were distant 
So I faced it in a direction, did that really critical shallow focus, made sure we planted our feet in the right place, and then set the intervalometer to shoot many, many, many pictures. And then we pulled out the light painting tools, black fiber optic wand, and while that 20 second exposure was happening, Gabe and I took turns dragging it around each other and making these cool shapes. There's only two forms of illum illumination here. One is this, the glow that's in the background, which is way out of focus, right? And that's, that's just there, right? We didn't create that. And then the other light was from our flashlight attached to this black fiber optic wand. And I think that's really fascinating. Use that time that you have that daytime photographers don't have to do cool stuff like wicked light painting, wicked light writing, uh, having people move a little bit after you pop the flash, combining flash and soft stuff, burning in star trails, and doing some star points. Get creative and use that to your advantage. Don't see it as a disadvantage because you can make portraits that really sing and snap and pop. Part three, use scale to your advantage. This shot was in Capitol Reef. When I shoot in national parks, I like to show our human scale against the geologic scale of time. In this case, uh, the portrait subject was so diminutive versus these giant rock landforms and the beautiful play of the clouds on the sky and the stars that I wanted to show that there was a difference in size. So I use that as an advantage here. And if you make humans small in relationship to the landscape, you can start to show some sort of visual appreciation for these beautiful places that we visit. This is Chris clambered up on what we affectionately call Chris Rock now at Olympic National Park. And he has one uh, of the Coast HP 7R flashlights pointing upwards and a Coast headlamp pointing forwards to illuminate in front of the rock and that water there. So that scale, it's still a portrait but it's a portrait of both the landscape and a person at the same time. Tip number four, try using a flash on your model's face and continuous lights on the other parts of their body to create sharp and soft areas. This picture uh, is also from the beginning of my night paper project. Um, we caught Skylar in midair with two flashes. You can follow the shadows on the ground to see where those flashes were. And I had these four foot long paper snoots on them too for really tight beam. So she was arrested in the air. And then I asked her to move forward slowly after the exposure while I used a flashlight on her uh, so that the movement of her up and down and the flashlight hitting the brightest parts of her costume would create that blur that led the eye out of the composition. Here in my latest project in Octavian's, this shot includes a lot of things going on. Number one, a lot of color, which I'm being very deliberate about. And number two is I have a flash set up about 40 feet away with a very directional reflector and a grid on it so that the light is in a very specific area, but the fall off happens over a long period of time. So from the right of the frame to the left of the frame, the flash doesn't fall off harshly. Uh, I wanted that for a reason. Uh, number one is I wanted the flash to have a specific angle and shadow, but two, I just wanted to snipe it in there. Then I have an LED light down behind the rock facing upwards with, instead of daylight balance with 3200 balance so that it, it hit the paper and turned it warm. The sky had some warm in it. And then I left the shutter open for a minute. So you can see there's a little bit of trail in the clouds, but not enough to totally obscure the fact or the shape that they're clouds. Combining all those three things together made for a successful night portrait. And then we took it into the woods and I gave enough exposure to show the Hudson River over here to come through the trees. I had the Lux Leviola off to the left set to this cool pink color. And then I stood behind and used a flashlight to make some edge lighting. And then there was also a flash over on the right hand side coming in on the face here. So you can see that there's many different kinds of sharp and soft and a brief burst of the pink light there. And then we leveled it up even more. Then we took it over here and we said, all right, let's make a, a real fantasy out of this one. Put the light sword attachment on from light painting brushes and had the flash fire from the left about 90 degrees. That's the, that's what created the arrested movement. And then there's a street light way the heck back there. That street light is filtering through the trees and creating this extra orange glow. So we took advantage of that. 
I stood behind and made two swipes with the light painting tools and then one that made a horn, turned this bird into a unicorn of sorts. And then the Luxley was on the ground facing backwards after I ran out of scene. I turned the Luxley up and down real quick with that pink color again to create a back glow. Now you can have your model face away from the flash if you want uh, and move away and create that ghosting effect. And you'll see that a little bit like in the legs here. She couldn't stand completely still. So that's what happens when you have another light source shining through right there. Now you might ask me, Matt, can't I just use a, a flashlight? Flashes are complicated or um, I don't want to learn the exposure or whatever your reason is. Yeah, you can, but you won't get as sharp a result on the face, which is really important as using a flash. But I have successfully used uh, flashlights only before. This is a great example of uh, shooting with Lance out in uh, Colorado. This I haven't edited out. That's my flashlight, uh, but I'm shooting really wide here. I dragged the flashlight up the side of Lance here to create this edge light. And then I ran around this side and just a super snipe up over here to 45 degrees. I did it on his face to create just this little area here. So his face would pop out against the sky, which I underexposed on purpose. This is flashlight only plus ambient and moonlight. So the moonlight looks like it's scraping his shoulder there. This one is moonlight behind him creating this, this forward shadow coming here. And then on his face is the light from the LCD screen. And I just asked him to stand still for 30 seconds and he is able to do that. So he's not quite as sharp as he could be. If I wanted that to be really sharp, I'd use a little flash. If you're gonna use a flash, I recommend getting a flash meter, a handheld flash meter and using that to measure your exposures. You'll save a lot of time and batteries that way rather than chimping your way towards a good exposure. You'll be a lot less frustrated because you're juggling so many different exposure variables. Tip number five, stop thinking and just experiment. Sometimes we are our worst enemy. We get in our own way and we overthink it, we overplan. Night photography has a lot of things that like we talked about before, we just can't comprehend because our time, our brain doesn't comprehend time that way so why don't you just try some things that you're not sure are going to work and see what happens and be surprised and delighted and learn from that for instance this photograph this was i just set up a behind the scenes camera to take pictures of people taking pictures while we we're doing uh the perseids meteor shoot great sand dunes this year and i love seeing people working. That's why I like doing behind the scenes pictures. I like to see how they operate. And this is a beautiful moment. We've got the Milky Way. We've got light pollution in the right hand corner from Alamosa, Colorado. And then we have the red lights of people doing checking their work in the various colored lights here. And they all come together to create a portrait of people creating. And I love that. The context for me is really special. I was there, and I hope that you find something in it too. Most important is to keep this in mind. Whatever I suggest you creatively might not really sync with your creativity. You don't have to take this as dogma. Take it as an opportunity to explore and get outside your own ideas of what's right and leave room for the possibility that something else could happen. It's just the, the opportunities are so great with night photography. It'd be a crime to not do that. Listen, night portraiture is difficult. No joke. It requires mastery of the fundamentals of night photography, including focus, composition, and exposure. You also need to have some knowledge of portrait lighting and how to use a flash. You also need to have an ability to direct your models clearly and in the dark. Practicing on your fellow night photographers is a great way to start. Just work between their exposures. Now that we've cleared the prerequisites, don't fret. You can learn simply by doing. Space on your memory card is free, so grab a friend and try it out. If you want to see more of what we did here in the written form, go visit the blog at nationalparksatnight.com. If you want to learn more about night portraiture, I have some very small groups that I'm teaching at Catskills Night Portraiture, two sessions, April and October of next year. Just hop on over to our website, nationalparksatnight.com, and I hope to see you at a workshop. Thanks a lot, happy shooting, and seize the night.